You know, we're looking at a new year. That's Tuesday, isn't it? Tuesday night. Uh, I hope you come for a prayer meeting that night. It's a prayer time. It's not singing. It's not preaching. We're going to be praying for an hour on Tuesday from 7 to 8. And that's the whole purpose uh, that we bring the new year in with prayer. And as we finish up the Christmas season, we've been preaching all about Jesus. And if you've been around me any length of time, you know everything I do, it's all about Jesus. It is all about Him. But I want to talk about languages for a second. I remember a number of years ago, Ellen and I, we were in England. And uh, we went to a, 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 it was a roadside stop or something. It was in London. And we wanted to order some fish and chips. And the guy was speaking to us. And he was speaking British English. And I didn't have a clue of what he was saying. We had to ask time and time again. Say that again? What? I, uh, you know, we were, uh, as someone said, the difference between England and, and America is that we're separated by a common language. And, and that's probably more true than we realize. Did you know that in the world today, and these numbers are changing, there are 7,111 different languages, different languages that they know about. We're still discovering new languages. But the, currently, there are 7,111 languages. This was a count that they've done just in this past year. And almost 3,000 of those languages, or the current count is 2,895, are endangered. They're endangered. These numbers are changing every day. In fact, uh, uh, we realize that a language is said to disappear every 14 days. Another language completely disappears. You see, endangered uh, languages are mainly those where the language are not taught to children of a social or people group. Uh, they grow up and there's another greater language that the children are learning in school. They're not taught their native language. And these languages are dying. And in fact, most of the languages of the world, most of those 7,000 languages, most of those are spoken by fewer than 1,000 people. More than half of the world's population speaks 23 one of 23 different languages. And as I mentioned, one language says to disappear every 14 days. 200 years ago, a German explorer, Alexander von Humboldt, he, he came upon a village in what's now Venezuela, and while there he heard a parrot speaking, and he asked the villagers, well, what's that language that parrot is speaking? And they said no one knew because that parrot was the last of a people of the Atur language. There was no one left alive speaking it, so no one can interpret what the parrot was speaking. Just a few years ago, two elderly brothers who lived in a coastal village in Scotland are the only two people left that can speak a particular dialect of the Scots language. People, their people made their living on the water, fishing in that fishing industry, but that fishing industry has gone away, and the language and the people that define that lifestyle and that language are also going away. They've discovered that when a way of life disappears, so do the words and the language that describe that life. In a multicultural and a multilinguistic setting, and you realize here in America we're, we're kind of different than a lot of the world. Most of the world speaks two or three different languages because of all the people groups around them. You go to Europe, you have people in Europe, they speak uh, French, German, uh, as well as English. Uh, we're one of the, only, uh, one of the few monolingual uh, groups of people. But even having said that, I was looking it up last night online, and they said there's over 300 different languages here in the USA, but they're spoken by very few people, most of them Indian languages. But in a multicultural, multilingual setting, 
SIL, and that's an organization that does translations around the world. Uh, um, a lot of Bible translators are associated with them. SIL described heart language, the heart language of a people group, is the most effective language for communicating deeply as well as uh, the language for a person to learn new concepts. Even in a group, uh, when we were in Indonesia, there were 400 different languages in Indonesia. The Indonesian language that we learned was a second language to most of the people of the population there. So uh, when we talk about a heart language, we're not talking about the language that they talk about uh, in a public or in a uh, commerce setting, but among families and among people groups. Their heart language and the heart language for many people are going away. The question I want to look at this morning is what's our heart language? And I'm not talking English here. I'm talking about our spiritual language. The spiritual language. Is it dying also? Has the Christian, look around you, read the paper. Is the Christian way of life so disappeared in America that we have lost the language to describe our Christian experience and to share it? More importantly, have we lost our ability to hear what God is saying? Has the media and modern secular society and the churches moved towards an exclusive language threatening our Christianity and our Christian way of life with extinction. What language in life do we practice? Jesus was discussing this with some uh, Pharisees. And if you would, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We're going to be looking at a few verses, 42 to 47. Uh, this is not an entirely uh, unfamiliar section of... Um, of um, passage of verses here. Uh, someone was asking me before, I think Ellen might have been asking, why don't I do a book study on the book of John? Well, I say, I preach from John too often. I think I preach more from John in this past year than I have of any single book in the Bible. Uh, John is so rich, I'm constantly preaching through it. But it's interesting, it is so deep in what Jesus says here. John chapter 8, we're looking at verses 42 to 47, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would have loved me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, Lord, help us to understand it. Open our hearts, open our ears, open our understanding to your word today. Lord, that, that we'll not be so overcome but with the language of the world to drown out your language, your speaking to us. Help us to hear your word today. May Jesus be glorified in this place, for it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. I love John chapter 8. It's an interesting chapter. It starts off with an interesting story with a woman caught in adultery. But it goes on quickly where Jesus uh, is defending himself and, and he's saying that he is the light of the world and, and the, the, he is debating with the Pharisees around him about who their father is. You know, they're quickly to point out that by blood they're related to Abraham. 
and that they only have one father, and that is God. Well, they just don't understand. Jesus asked a very pertinent question in verse 43. Look at verse 43 a second. John 8, verse 43. He says, why do you not understand my speech? It wasn't because Jesus was speaking another language or he was speaking in riddles. In fact, for that matter, we can go back, especially in the books of uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we can look at his parables and, and, and we know that his parables, only those that are in tune with God would really understand them. Matthew 13, verse 13, uh, Jesus is explaining to his disciples, he says, Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. The parables that Jesus spoke involved everyday things and events, yet only those that were close to Jesus understood. Even Jesus had to explain uh, a number of those parables to them. For instance, when he spoke of bread, many people thought that he was speaking of literal bread. And when he was speaking of water, they never connected it with spiritual water. Why was it that they could not understand his speech? Was it because they were unwilling to tolerate? I love that word, tolerate. That's a uh, that's a word that is grossly misused today. But they were unwilling to tolerate. They were unwilling to accept his teachings. You see, communications is a uh, tricky thing. I, I had to take a course in communications. I, uh, I think it was called uh, something fancy like interpersonal relationships or some such thing. And, 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 it, and it talks about, uh, we learned that when somebody speaks and what they hear... When one person speaks and what another hears and what they understand are often two different things. We know that. I talked with my kids and it's like I'm speaking a foreign language to them. It's, 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 uh, we don't, what I say, and oftentimes what I say and what I mean are two different things too. Communications is a difficult thing. It's not, it, it, it's complicated. And what we hear and what we understand are influenced by our values, by our prejudices, by our biases, and by our predispositions. In the passage preceding our focal verses, Jesus was discussing who the Pharisee's father was. They were descendants of Abraham in the physical sense, and they claim God as their father in the spiritual sense. But Jesus corrects them. John 8, verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. If God was their father, they would know who Jesus was. John explains that a little more detail over in his little letter of 1 John. 1 John 5, verse 1, he says, he says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves him who begot, loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. In other words, if you know God, you know the one that comes from God. God gives that discernment. If we claim to love God the Father... We must also love God the Son. Jesus was sent from God. And in fact, as we discussed over uh, this Christmas holidays, and as we looked at John 1.1, 1, 1, we know that Jesus is God. And God the Father sent Jesus the Son on a mission. What was Jesus' mission? We read this a few weeks ago. John 3 verse 17 we know John 3, 16, John 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The mission of being Savior of the world was being rejected. Moving on to John 8, verse 43. 
And Jesus asked the question, don't you understand my speech? Do you not understand my speech? And he answers the question, because you are not able to listen to my word. They don't understand Jesus' speech because they have rejected his word. They have rejected his message. It's interesting, and you know I like going into the Greek and looking at the word. Uh, the Greek word for, for speech is lilian, and it means a manner of talking or a manner of speaking in word. And where it says, they, uh, where he says, not able to listen to my word. The word there is logos. That's an interesting word because it's the same word used in John 1 1. You know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Same word here. And it means a message. The Pharisees did not understand Jesus' speech because they both could not understand the message and what they did understand of it, it was thoroughly rejected. Why? It had a lot to do with who their spiritual father was. And Jesus goes on and he tells them in verse 44, he says, you, speaking to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. You know, this is a serious accusation made by Jesus and it didn't go unnoticed. Their spiritual father was the devil. The word devil means a slanderer, a deceiver. And why does Jesus say they are children of the devil? Because they do as their father, the devil, does. They possess his nature. They lie, they cheat, they want to kill. There is no truth in the devil. In fact, lies are the language, is the language of the devil. It said in there he was a murderer from the beginning. This is a clear reference to Adam and Eve, you know, uh, we know the story. The serpent came down and he deceived them. And the serpent orchestrated the death of Adam and Eve. He was a murderer from the beginning. And even now we know that the Pharisees, together with the high priest and the other religious officials, had Jesus put to death. They were murderers as well. The Pharisees also lied. They pretended to be godly, deceiving themselves and others. Interesting chapter to read is Second Timothy chapter 3. And over there it says in verse 5, it says that they had a form of godliness but denied its power. And in verse 7 it says they were always learning, yet never coming to the truth. They were followers of the ruler of this world. Make no mistake, the ruler of this world is Satan. Uh, in fact, Jesus uh, talks about it. Uh, they were following the ruler of the world. The ruler of the world and the ruler of this age is the devil. In John 12, verse 31, John 14, verse 30, uh, Jesus is speaking. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world. Uh, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Uh, 14, verse 30, I will no longer... Uh, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. We're talking about the devil. We're talking about Satan. And the truth has no place with the ruler of this world. Why? Because uh, going back to, uh, to our verse in chapter 8, it says he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. The devil, the deceiver, the ruler of this world is covering the ears of those who will follow and he covers them up with the ways of the world. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 4, Paul writes, he says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light, lest the light, of, the gospel, uh, light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. And then going back to John chapter 8, he says, for he speaks from his own resources. When I study for uh, these messages, I, I, I'm very careful to read in different uh, translations. And I actually like the NIV translation uh, for this particular phrase. And it says, when he lies, he speaks his native language. 
the Greek implies that the devil speaks out of his nature, out of his inherent nature or his character. Lies, as I had mentioned earlier, is the language of the devil. And it was from this reading in the NIV, I was coming up with the title for the sermon, What's Our, what's our Native Language? If we're following the devil and we're following in his ways, we're going to speak the same language as the world and as the devil. What is our heart language? And this is the failure of the church. We become so accustomed to the native language of the ruler of this age and the ruler of this world that we begin to lose what it should be our heart language and we begin to lose our ability to discern the things of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14, you know this verse. He says, but the natural man... The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You know, we're looking out to a new year here. What are we listening to? What are we listening to? You know, one of the reasons why we observe the Lord's Supper is we need to be reminded of the language of God and what Jesus has done for us. We quickly forget which language are we hearing, which language are we speaking. The fact is we cannot have it both ways. And in a spiritual sense, we cannot be bilingual. James made it quite clear to the Christians that he was writing to it. Uh, he, he didn't mince any words here. James 4, verse 4. James says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Speaking the world's language going along with what the world says, going along with the philosophies of the world will make you an enemy of God. Listening to the world can be deadly to the life of a Christian. And following the world is following the ruler of this age. You know, Satan, above all things, is a liar. And why do we lie? Why are there lies there? But to deceive. But to deceive. And Jesus was saying that those who follow, by, follow the devil are characterized by deceit. People deceive themselves about their own hearts. They deceive themselves about life itself. They deceive themselves about who Jesus really is. They deceive themselves about the nature of God. They deceive themselves about the way of salvation and the ultimate deception among many in the church today is the ultimate deception to imagine you are a child of God when you are not. The truth is disbelieved by the world if for no other reason because it is the truth. Jesus said in chapter 8 verses 45 and 46, he says, because I tell the truth you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? That, that, it's interesting there. Convicts means to prove. How can they prove him of sin? They've accused of Jesus of a lot of sins, but they can't prove any of it. And he see, he, Jesus goes on to say, If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? The children of God would so love the truth that they will believe in Jesus. The children of the devil will be so characterized by lies that they will not be able to accept the truth precisely because it is the truth. That's the world today. Truth can hit you upside of the head, and they wouldn't know it. Verse 47, this is key. He who, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. The statement is quite clear. Jesus speaks the very words of God. Only those who belong to him can hear and understand the timeless truths of the entire universe. Those who reject him by nature will also reject his truths. Those who hear and understand his words will also obey his words. There are people who say, well, that's, you know, I know God. 
I live God and I don't have to be in church. You know, we, we, we've, we've watered down the message here, you know. I, I, I can worship out on the golf course, you know, and, and I, can do, I, I can do anything I want to do and because God loves me, God is love, and, you know, he won't, he won't condemn, you know, a loving God won't condemn people to hell. Those who hear and understand his word also obeys his word. 1 John 2, verses 2 to 3. Uh, John writes and he says, by, Now by this we know that we know him. By this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, does, and does not keep his commandment, is a liar and the truth is not in him. I'm not calling him a liar. The word of God calls him a liar. He says, and the, is a liar, and the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Are we keeping his word? Are we keeping his word? You see, the devil deceives, and he lies, and he leads many astray. The world all around us have bought into the lie. Uh, uh, Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 1. I preached on this last uh, about a year ago is one of the darkest chapters in all of the Bible, that last half of chapter 1. But he says in Romans 1, verse 25, he talks about them who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The world worships the creation all around them, and they reject the creator. Is it any wonder that Christians are under attack today? Here in America, the spiritual language by which we were founded on is gone. Uh, America has lost its moral compass. We can look around us, and, and, and it's, a, it's a struggle. America as a whole, I'm not talking about exceptions, and there are exceptions, but as a whole, we have long lost the understanding of God's word. We have literally turned our backs upon God and do not acknowledge him in any shape or form. We're looking towards a new year here. Is it going to get worse? Or are we going to do something to change it? We do not, as a people, do not acknowledge God in the public forum in any way, shape, or form. And now, even that we see in our government, and we see some glimmers of hope here and there, but you know, uh, we see in the highest level of government and in our courts, God's truth is systematically being rejected. America has endorsed perversion, same-sex marriage, and we'll call it a viable life, alternate lifestyle. We reward laziness, and we call it welfare. We kill our pre-born children, and we call it a choice. We neglect to discipline our children, and we'll call it building self-esteem. And when we do discipline our children, they're quick to point out that it's child abuse. The government abuses its power and calls it political savvy. We have polluted our airways, television, movies, internet with profanity and pornography, and we call it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed and methodically torn down time-honored values of our forefathers, and we call it enlightenment. You see, we changed the language. We changed our understanding. It's clear that America is under the authority of the God of this age, the ruler of this world. We have lost the heart language of which we were founded on, and I grieve. I grieve deeply over that. Has the United States of America passed the point of no return? I don't know. But judgment is coming. The prophet Isaiah foresaw this 2,700 years ago. He said in Isaiah 5, verses 20, 21, you've heard these verses, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Whoa, we're there. Who put darkness for light, light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. So how are we to come and believe the truth? You see, we believe the truth 
not because it's anything we choose to do. We believe the truth because we are drawn by the moving of God's Spirit in our lives. John 6, 44. Jesus made it very clear here in a number of other passages, and I've used this passage a number of times. It says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is only through the Spirit speaking to our hearts that we're able to believe the truth at all. And do you realize when the Spirit of God speaks to a heart for the first time, In that person's life, do they have a real choice to make? They can choose to believe what God has led them to believe, or they can choose to reject it. It's only through the Spirit of God that we have the capability of believing the truth. And it's at this point of drawing to Him that we have the choice. And our choice is either to believe it or to reject it. This morning, the question this morning is not whether, it's whether or not you know the truth. And Jesus was very clear about knowing the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you know the truth, you will know Jesus. Know Jesus. You see, the lies of the world, the language of the world, wants to draw us away. In fact, Jesus tells us over in Matthew 24, he says, if it were possible, the ruler of this world would lure away even the very elect, the very saved of this world. But we can come to this truth. We can come to Jesus if the Spirit calls. And when the Spirit calls, do we answer? Or do we go on following the ways of the world? Even those that have answered the call get caught up in the lies of the world and we've grown insensitive we can only come to the truth will we answer the call we're going to sing a hymn here in a minute wherever he leads i'll go you know uh, jesus is leading the question is will we follow let's pray heavenly father may we speak and may we understand your word today. May we speak and may we understand. May we may we know you in our heart language. May we know the truth which is Jesus. Lord, lay open our hearts before you today. May we see, may we understand And help us to accept what is the truth. And we're asking that all glory goes to Jesus for what all you call for us to do. And we thank you and praise you. It would take eternity praising you for what you have done for us. Lord, move among us, speak to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.